Good morning and welcome to This Week. Sunday Showdown. The task of perfecting our union moves forward. Obama's big gun, Jim Messina. Because you did the incredible work we are celebrating today. Bush's architect, Karl Rove. The winning campaign chiefs face off for the first time on our Powerhouse Roundtable, only on This Week. Plus, the president overseas. Do the away from Congress. <laughs> we'll get insight on what comes next from our foreign policy experts, including ABC's global affairs anchor Christian Amanpour and The Atlantic's Jeffrey Goldberg, fresh from the president's trip. From ABC News, This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Reporting from ABC News headquarters, George Stephanopoulos. Hello again. You're going to see President Obama touching down at Andrews Air Force Base late last night after his first trip to Israel as president. We're going to analyze the mission and what comes next for that volatile region later in the program. But first, the big debates Obama is returning to here at home. Guns, immigration, gay marriage, and the budget. And for that, uh, this week first, Jim Messina and Carl Rowe join our Powerhouse Roundtable. Welcome to both of you, along with our This Week veterans, Donna Brazil, Peggy Noonan, of the Wall Street Journal and Nightline co-anchor Terry Moran. Thanks to all of you. And Carl, let me begin with you. Saturday, 5 a.m., the Senate finally passes a budget, the first if in four years for the Democrats. House has already passed a budget. Very stark differences between the two. Everyone waiting for President Obama to weigh in as well. But I guess my question to you is, despite those stark differences, do you see this as the beginning of negotiations toward a compromise. I, I frankly take this as a constructive sign. I have not understood why the Senate Democrats have not passed a budget resolution for the last four years. It gives the guidelines for the Senate to go pass appropriations bills under what's called protection. That is to say, they don't require 60 votes to, as long as they live within the limits. And this sets up then the normal flow of Congress with House passing a budget with less spending, Senate Democrats passing a budget with more spending and going to conference and working out the difficulties. It requires hard work. It requires work by the committees. But that's the way that things actually give and take. When we get in a situation where everything has to be dictated from above, like with these continuing resolutions, we set up unnecessary And, crises. Jim, the president seems to have had the same insight. He's now started to go around the Republican leaders and work one-on-one -on -one with Republican senators. Well, he's done that for four years. And I think it, I agree with Carl. It's Not gonna, that much. Uh, look, I was there the first two years. I spent a lot of time sitting with him talking to Republicans on both the House and the Senate. Uh, that's what he's done. That's what the record is. And that's what you've seen him do in the past few weeks. I agree with you that we are working across party lines. I think the Senate passing the budget is a good step. It's along the lines of the proposals the president's laid out. And I think it'll move us forward. But one of the things you're seeing down in Brazil is as we head into this next phase, the president President's poll numbers have been dropping now below 50 percent, basically even now with the Republicans on the economy, even though he had a big advantage after the election. Well, look, when you're in the business of trying to form a, a, a compromise, get the other side to even come to the table with some common sense ideas, I'm not surprised that the president is, is a little lower than 50 percent. But, you know, we have a budget now. We have a moral document, a blueprint for uh, the, the, the policy debates that are going to take place this summer. One of the interesting things I enjoyed watching this at 2 a.m., and I'm sure some other people were up as well, is that we got a chance... I don't know if they were watching C-SPAN, <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't get those other channels, George. <laughs> but but we, we t they had an opportunity to talk about the Keystone Pipeline. They had an opportunity to talk about a biannual budget. They had an opportunity to talk about immigration. So this gave the, the senators more than an opportunity to talk about big issues as well as the, the budgetary numbers. Also, Terry Miranda scored a lot of political points with all those amendments. They did. And while this is a normal piece of legislative business, and that's very encouraging, no more a uh, cliff diving, at least on this issue. One does wonder why they did it at five in the morning. Uh, you know, why it has to work in such a strange and dysfunctional way at the end of, at the end of the day. But it is a good thing that they got it done. Nodding your head. Uh, yeah, it, it does seem a little strange that they work sometimes on the Hill in a slightly banana Republican-esque <laughs> kind of way where they're making moves at 3 a.m. while all of America is asleep. That having been said, somebody, I think you, George, mentioned the president's numbers deflating a little bit uh, in the past few weeks. I don't think we should forget this is not all just, quote, budget related. It is, I think it tracks perfectly the sequester drama in which I think a number of Americans started to think the White House is playing games on this. Uh, and I think it also tended to track a few other things, like a sense that 
the president may not get down in the middle of things and get them going. Also, there is Obamacare, which each day is being followed by some newspaper story saying there's a new part of it that the Senate decided they had to vote out. And there's a new part that's going to cost you $1,000 more a year. All of this comes together and I think has a somewhat damaging mm -hmm. impact. And, and one of the questions is what right effect it has on well. the president's ability to get yeah. all the yeah. items on his, on his agenda passed. I do want to move to another one because there's significant action this week on, on guns. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw Senator Harry Reid basically say he's not going to include the assault weapons ban in his yeah. uh, base package on gun control. And it's turned all of the fire on this issue of background checks. One of the things we saw overnight, Mayor Bloomberg of New York starting a $12 million ad campaign in tar to target uh, swing senators. For me, guns are for hunting and protecting my family. I believe in the Second Amendment and I'll fight to protect it. But with rights come responsibilities. That's why I support comprehensive background checks so criminals and the dangerously mentally ill can't buy guns. That protects my rights and my family. Jim Messina, it was no secret there was a lot of resistance from Democrats on the assault weapons ban, including uh, Harry Reid. You saw Mayor Bloomberg right there. He's going to be advertising in both Democratic and Republican districts, Democrat and Republican states. You know, you work with Organizing for Action, the president's mm -hmm. uh, super PAC, support the president's agenda. Are you going to target ads against Democrats as well as Republicans on this issue? Look, we're going to work out, reach out to members of both parties on this. Now, background checks are supported by over 92% of Americans, including a majority of the NRA members, a majority of Republicans. There's clear consensus in the states uh, on this issue, and we're absolutely going to talk to members of both parties. So you'll be, you'll be advertising in Democratic districts? We'll figure out what advertising is, but we're talking on grassroots. Last week, we had over 100 events across uh, the country in both Democratic and Congressional or and Republican Congressional seats. We have over a million volunteers in the first month alone getting involved on this and other issues, and we're absolutely going to be advocating on the president's agenda. We're still seeing Carl Rove, the National Rifle Association, digging in against universal background checks. Look, uh, if you say, should we uh, keep uh, the mentally ill and the, and the criminals from getting guns, everybody say yes. But that's not what this is about. We're talking about, uh, in this instance, Having a registry where if a grandfather wants to give a treasured shotgun to his grandson or granddaughter, he has to register with the government and go get approval of the government to give that gun so to his grandchild. No, well, no, it's also transferring it. And in addition, Senator Schumer, for some reason or another, insists upon keeping a registry of guns. Now, if there's one thing that scares a lot of people who believe in the Second Amendment, it's the federal government keeping a national registry of gun sales and gun purchasers and gun owners. And, and, and but, but if you if, don't have if, records, if, how does the background check make any difference? Well, it, it, yeah, it does make a difference. You, 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 you find out if somebody can or cannot purchase a gun. Right now, I can go into a gun store in Texas to purchase a weapon. I have it to go through a background check. They have to ascertain I don't have a criminal record. And then I can purchase a gun. But, but what we're talking about here is different than that. And, and why it's different than that, and why it's different than that is politics. There could be a lot of mutual agreement found on closing some of these so-called gun show loopholes. We could probably get agreement on a widespread basis of people saying, look, you go to a gun show, you walk in, you, get, you, you, get, you pass a check, you get, you get your little stub that allows you to purchase a weapon, and that's it. But this goes far beyond that. What's the answer to that? Look, 40% of all gun sales currently don't go through background checks. The background checks have stopped 2 million people from getting, uh, from getting guns they shouldn't get. But we know there's loopholes all over the place. And Carl, just saying no, which is what the NRA and your party is doing right now, isn't moving us forward. Well, I agree. Well, let, let's, let's be clear about this. This is prompted by the Sandy Hook murders. Those guns were legally purchased with a background check. This would not have stalled something like that. Let's be very careful about quickly trampling on the rights of the people. And, and look, do you want to get something done? Then stop scaring people. Don't say we're going to keep a registry of all these guns. No and stopped. let's not make it so impractical. <laughs> stop or, 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 stop scaring or, people. Stop scaring. You're scaring people with this Orwellian sense that black helicopters and the government, if we register guns, are going to confiscate Americans' guns. That kind of paranoia... Uh, fuels. With all due respect, it is not paranoia. But who's going to confiscate a, all the people guns? People have in America? a fear of this. Why do it? Why do you need it? Lots of things are registered in the United States yeah, but, of but America because they're dangerous. Do we register because books? We want do we register other things that are constitutionally protected? No, we don't. And the, the result of this is that the only votes really that have been taken since Newtown have weakened gun control in America. Some of those votes the Senate took last week to prevent the Justice Department, for example, from taking a look at gun shop owners' inventory to make sure there haven't been thefts, voted down. So, Peggy Newton, maybe things haven't changed after Newtown much at all. 
Here's what I think the problem is. I think Congress is attempting to act in a way that ignores a central fact. The central fact is that nobody in America really trusts Congress. If you're Congress and you admit nobody really trusts us, then you make simple, discreet, five-page bills, not these big, comprehensive things that involve being assault weapons and this and that, and putting it forward and then having everybody say, whoa, I'm not sure I trust you. The reason Americans don't trust these big bills is that they assume so much mischief is hidden inside I, I, them. I take your point on that, but doesn't extending a background check from gun stores to gun shows, doesn't that fit that bill of kind of, kind of simple, simplicity? If we are at the point where that is a simple bill on its own, existing on its own, I think it could go forward and do well as long as it does take care of certain things that may be going too far. But Senator Reid but, thinks he can get through cloture if he puts the background uh, proposal up first and then couple it with uh, gun safety measures to keep our schools safe uh, and then perhaps open it up to additional amendments. Look, I, I think there's, there's still room for negotiation. Senator Manchin of, of West Virginia is working with the NRA. Gun owners, 82 percent of them believe that this is something that should occur. And I do believe that we're going to have some action on assault weapons, which I, I, I don't believe that we have the votes on that. But I still believe that Senator Reid should allow the amendment to come up and let, let the both parties go on record saying where they stand on assault. And that is likely to weapons. happen. I want to move on to something else we saw this week. We saw a pretty remarkable um, report coming out of the Republican National Committee uh, and their chairman, Reince Priebus, the Growth and Opportunity Project. He called it 100 pages diagnosing what went wrong for the Republican Party in the last presidential election. Here he was introducing it. Focus groups described our party as narrow-minded, out of touch, and, quote, stuffy old men. Our message was weak. Our ground game was insufficient. We weren't inclusive. We were, we were behind in both data and digital. And our primary and debate process needed improvement. So there's no one solution. There's a long list of them. Carl Rove, you go through it and it was pretty candid, fairly harsh diagnosis of what went wrong in the last election and in the last several presidential uh, and national elections. But in, in some ways, it didn't seem as if the um, solutions matched the diagnosis. diagnosis. You know, fewer, fewer debates, uh, fewer primaries, maybe an earlier convention. Yeah. Well, look, there, there are tactical challenges for the party, and those are easily described, and you can define a crisp answer to it. But the party also faces strategic issues, and those aren't so easy to either define or to provide the answer. And, and, and it's unlikely to come from the national chairman. One of the interesting things that's happened is if you look in recent months, Paul Ryan, Marco Rubio, Bobby Jindal, Scott Walker, uh, a number of other party leaders have come forward with very interesting speeches talking about the future of the party. And this is the process that each party goes through after having lost a presidential election. And I think this is a constructive process, and I see a lot coming out of it. One strain that you see in most of these speeches is that the Republican Party has to change from being simply a party of green eye shades to being a party that, that stands for the right of every American to rise and as a party that emphasizes economic growth and prosperity uh, over green eye shade issues. And I think that's probably right, because that allows us to make our argument in every corner, every community in America in a powerful way. And, uh, and, and coming from voices like Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley and Susanna Martinez and Marco Rubio gives us some greater credibility in those communities. Did you think the report got what went wrong for the Republicans? Absolutely not. Look, I think there's great things in that report, uh, and I think it got it right on the tactics, and I agree with Carl. The problem is it misses the entire point. They didn't lose 71% of the Latino vote because of tactics. They didn't lose over 60% of the youth vote and women by double digits because of tactics or outreach or data. They lost it because they're wrong on the issues and their parties moved so far to the right that they no longer speak to the majority of Americans. The Pew poll came out this morning, an interesting column saying that the Republican brand is at its lowest ebb in 30 years. 33% approve, 58% disapprove. That's not about tactics, that's about issues. And Andrew Coe at Peggy Noonan, who wrote, who wrote uh, that report, says that this is, he hasn't seen a situation like this where a party was so far out of the center since the Democrats following Gene McCarthy in 1968. You know, I, I tend to think that the, the GOP's central problems have to do with things we don't talk all that much about. One is 
what happened in 2008 and the continuing repercussions Financial of crisis. the crash. The repercussions, where the party stands, uh, what its positions are on how to create growth, that is becoming in part within the party a rising uh, disagreement, not disagreement, but a rising uh, difference of emphasis between those who are saying the way we have to go is growth right now and those who are saying we've got to handle this debt and deficit thing. They're sort of uh, different approaches. Another is that I think the Republican Party has to make clear what its foreign policy is. Uh, it's had uh, uh, two wars for the past 12 years. People are still settling in and thinking, I mean, the voters have said, we don't like that. We're not for that. The Republican Party has to make clear what it stands for, and it's going to have to have a little bit debate to get there. So I think those two big things and the policies that spring from them will make all the difference, and so will an eventual compelling presidential candidate. Somebody who is involved right now is going to work his way through. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it is the candidates who resolve a lot of unresolved things by taking a stand and speaking forcefully for it. That was Bill forward. Clinton after Dukakis's loss in 88. That, that it was, was indeed. That was Bill Clinton after Walter Mondale loss, after Jimmy Carter loss. We mm -hmm. had a dynamic governor who was reform-minded, who took those reform issues and brought them into the national forefront. He really helped. Uh, recharge the Democratic Party. But you know the Republican Party is out to lunch. I watch CPAC, Charles, I mean, uh, uh, our, Carl. 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 <laughs> Charles, well, Charles was a former friend. <laughs> well, anyway, I thought Charles. I was a current friend. <laughs> you're always a friend, but you owe me, you owe me some chili. Yeah. So, um, you owe me some fried chicken. Well, I saved your life with malaria once. There we go, yes, you did. Yes, indeed. This is also yeah, it really but, is. But, but, <laughs> all right, we go I'm back a long way. But here's the thing. Um, the Republican Party is out to lunch. It's not just mechanics. It's not just communication. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's the, the party that continues to reject the majority of the American people, and they feel it. They don't want to be associated with a party that talks down to them, that's condescending, that attacks their rights, and, and then call them victims. So I think they're out to lunch, and as far as I'm concerned, I will give them a, a, a bus ticket pass to continue to stay off the national radar. And when I was covering the White House and Carl was, was in it with George W. Bush, it was, it was a Republican Party that was looking to that tomorrow and reaching out, winning 40-plus percent of the Hispanic vote. I remember there was an event in the East Room where President George W. Bush said, on Thomas Jefferson's birthday, I'm happy and proud to welcome both sides of the Jefferson family, the descendants of yeah. Sally Hammond. A Republican couldn't get away with that today. Oh, I didn't know. It's, oh, it's, well, I, dis it's, I disagree, no. but it was a gracious moment. Not I totally their nomination. No, they no, no, I totally agree. Oh, oh, well, wait, we are starting please. to see a change this week. Actually, something happened this week that does signal some opening up to the 71% who voted for President Obama, Latinos. Mm -hmm. You saw Rand Paul, interestingly, yeah. really break the dam on immigration. A lot of people saw the speech that he gave and said this could be the signal that immigration reform passes this year. We aren't going to deport 12 million illegal immigrants. If you wish to live and work in America, then we will find a place for you. In order to bring conservatives to this cause, however, those who work for reform must understand that a real solution must ensure that our borders are secure. Now, Carl Rove, it is true. That is not the kind of language you heard during the Republican primary debate, certainly yeah. not but look, from Mitt Romney, but a big let's, shift. Let's be clear. Look, before we, before we assign the Republican Party the dustbin of history, 30 out of 50 governors in the United States are Republicans. Republicans have elected in 2010 the largest number of state legislators since 1920. They, a majority of state legislators are Republicans. The U.S. House is a Republican. The Senate would have been Republican had it were it not for bad candidates. I suspect we have a lot of agreement that were it not for the Sharon Angles and Todd Akins and Richard Murdoch's of the world, there might even actually be a Republican Senate majority. And this president got reelected with a smaller percentage of the vote than he got elected four years ago. And nobody believes that he got reelected because of a compelling, positive, forward-looking agenda for America. He irradiated Mitt Romney and made him a plutocrat with a wife who was an open-practicing equestrian, as my friend Haley Barber says. So <laughs> let's not kid ourselves. We have two robust parties. Each have got their own problems. The Republican Party has got its problems. The Democratic Party has got its problems. And we're likely to see a competitive political environment for decades to come. Now, as to Rand Paul, good comment. Republicans need to help resolve the issue of immigration reform in order to get this issue behind us. And I think it's interesting. Mitt Romney got 27 percent of the Latino vote. In the battleground states with exit polling, he got 32. And in the battleground of battlegrounds, Ohio, 
he got 42 percent of the Latino vote. Now, maybe that's a little bit of small sample and so forth and so on. But nonetheless, the fact of the matter is, is the more he was able to make these arguments about the economy and deficit and debt and the Affordable Care but Act. Don't you have to get certain things out of the way then? Doesn't the Republican Party have to pass immigration reform, seem to be passing it to avoid having the appearance Republicans that they're not play, welcoming? Republicans the have to play a role in that, absolutely. And look, we have to, it can't be solved just simply by that. My former White House deputy, Ruben Brales, has taken the leadership of an effort in California to help recruit and elect Hispanic Republicans at the local level. Last fall, they elected 100 Hispanic Republicans to school boards, new new elections to school boards, city councils, local uh, local units of government. Their goal is to elect 300 this year. That's the kind of concerted effort that we need to make, and we need to take our spokesmen like Susana Martinez and Brian Sandoval, governors of New Mexico and Nevada, and Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz, and get them out there along with the rest of the party communicating around the country. It, it's it's amazing to me. In Texas, a Republican naturally campaigns everywhere in Texas including Latino communities, African-American communities, Anglo communities, rural, urban. But in, in, in other states, that's just not normal. We it, need to make it normal. The other place that the Republican Party is going to have to seem more welcoming on social issues, big week coming up uh, this week on gay marriage. The Supreme Court is going to be uh, looking at two big cases. Interestingly, before this, we saw Hillary Clinton uh, come out this week and say she was for gay marriage. LGBT Americans are our colleagues our teachers, our soldiers, our friends, our loved ones. And they are full and equal citizens and deserve the rights of citizenship. That includes marriage. That's why I support marriage for lesbian and gay couples. Donna Brazil, interestingly, her first message since yeah. uh, stepping down as Secretary of State. Absolutely. But you know, it echoes something she said a few months ago at the UN, gay rights is human rights. This is a, a big moment this week. Two big cases. Terry probably know more about them than I do. A moment for the country to finally get on the right side of history. Dr. Kane said the, 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 the history of the world is long, but it always bends toward justice. A moment to look at the Proposition 8, uh, in California and, and declared unconstitutional and also to repeal DOMA. These are two big cases and it's going to have a major impact and, on and our society. And Terry, you do society. cover the Supreme Court for us. I want to ask you about this because it seems to put uh, two justices especially in an in a, uh, interesting position. Justice Kennedy, of course, the traditional swing vote for the justices, but maybe even more Chief Justice mm. John Roberts, 58 years old, likely to be Chief Justice for a long time. You see how support for gay marriage has surged in the last year, even if he personally may be against it. He's likely to look and see, you know, in 10, 15 years, when I'm still sitting on the bench, it's going to be 70 percent support in the country. How does he grapple with that? Th that's a great point. There's an institutional challenge to the court in the astonishing speed that the country's changed its mind on this. Uh, the people are way ahead of the elites. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when she ran for president, was against gay marriage. The president, when he ran for president, was against gay marriage. The, the Supreme Court, within a generation, outlawed sodomy for gay people, but not for straight people. Now, they overturned that decision, and he doesn't want to be that chief justice, I think, caught on the wrong side. On the, at the same time, this is a court, and these are justices, who I don't think want to declare once and for all uh, the way Americans should live. I think they want to let the people do what the people are doing. It you know, it's interesting, Peggy Noonan, yeah. Justice Kennedy in a speech in Sacramento uh, this month said, uh, a democracy should not be dependent for its major decisions on what nine unelected people from a narrow legal background have to say. Yeah, Americans don't take it well and don't accept it as a resolution when their black-robed masters in Washington decide to put on them what they decide is the right thing. The, one of the great sins of Roe versus Wade, the, the abortion decision of 40 years ago, was that it decided everybody has to do it one way instead of leaving it to the states. It seems to me it, it is certainly in line with conservative political thinking, but I think it would be acceptable certainly to liberal thinking that when there are these gnawing, disagreeing questions going on in America, if you can't solve it here, you can say everybody can solve it down there. Let state by state make their decision. You will immediately have New York having some of the most liberal uh, uh, decisions on this issue. You will perhaps have Utah or Arkansas having less liberal decisions. Work 
questions out that way as much as possible. Carl Rove, can you imagine the next presidential campaign, a Republican candidate saying flat out, I am for gay marriage? I, I could. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but you know what? This, let's stay for, for here for a moment. Yeah. One of the interesting things to me is going to be, we've talked about Justice Roberts and Justice Kennedy. I'm interested in Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Who has had, well, she has had comments in the past about a Roe v. Wade, which Peggy mentioned, Absolutely. that said, in essence, went too far, went too, too far, fast. too we far, too fast. Yes. And, and, we should, and we maybe should not have imposed one national view from the court. And what we may see is a decision here that, in essence, has not a 5-4 decision, but a 6-3-7-2 that says, Leave it up to the states. In fact, we could see an 8 1. And interesting, Jim has seen that even the president is not willing to go quite that far yet. I sat down with him two weeks mm -hmm. ago, and he went farther than he ever had before in saying that gay marriage is a right guaranteed uh, by the Constitution. Basically, he said he can't imagine circumstances in a state where a ban could be upheld, but still not going quite that far in enunciating the straight constitutional principle. Well, look, I think he's been clear in his position. The country's had a, a discussion led by him on his evolution. I think I agree with Terry. The country's moved dramatically on this in 10 years. 37% support 10 years ago, now 58%, including 81% of young people. Part of the problems Carl's party have right now with young voters is people look at them on this, on contraception, and think they're completely out of touch. I think the president, in this, on these two cases, has laid out our arguments. The Solicitor General is, is arguing the case in front of him. The president has said very clearly, we do not favor discrimination. That's why we've come out against Prop 8, and we've come out against every state attempt to regulate this. And but Go ahead. One of the things that, that, that's happened, uh, Senator Portman coming out this week saying his son's uh, oh, gayness and, his, and the, the, that's changed his mind. Gay people have liberated themselves in this country, and there are tons of Republican legislators in the federal government and in the state governments who have sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, colleagues and friends, who are coming out and saying, how can you really stand against us on this issue of our love and our hearts? And... That is how the change is happening. Is this movement right. ine inevitable? Oh, George Will said something here a few weeks ago. <laughs> he said, look, opposition is literally dying out. It is the older Americans, uh, not the younger Americans. One of the things that I like, by the way, about a compromise in which state by state does it, it's not only localities and keeping power local. It also takes a little time. Sometimes it's good when everything takes a little time to settle itself Take some down. Of the heat out of it. May I note, by the way, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a famous court liberal, her acknowledging very recently was in I think the Times today that the Roe versus Wade decision, the abortion decision, had gone too far and was an overreach. That is an epic statement That's from an American statement. liberal left. And that is the last word for right now. Thank you all for a terrific roundtable.